hear a telephone conversation between a receptionist who works at a house renting agency and a man. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, how can I help you today? Ah yes, hello. I'm just phoning you as I have seen an advertisement on your website for a property that I'm interested in renting. If possible, I'd like to find out some more information before I organise a viewing. No problem at all. What is the address of the property that you'd like to inquire about? It's 21 North Avenue. OK, what is it that you'd like to know? First of all, I'd like to know what facilities the office has, as I need to make sure that it'll be suitable for my advertising company. I see. The office contains a large open plan space with a wide frontage onto a busy street with lots of passers-by, so your business would have a really good street presence. There is also a toilet and newly refurbished kitchen equipped with a dishwasher and oven. Wow, that sounds great. I'd definitely like to register my interest. OK, perfect. I just need to take some details from you, if that's OK. What is your full name? Jonathan Smith. And what position do you hold in your company, Jonathan? Until recently I was sales manager. However, I have recently been promoted to regional manager, so I'll be in charge of running our new office. Can I ask where the office is located? Yes, of course. It's located downtown just around the corner from Royal Square Shopping Centre. Hmm, that's a bit too far out of the centre for my liking. I'd much prefer to be located in close proximity to the station. Do you have any property located in that vicinity? It would help me to narrow down the results if you could tell me how many employees you intend to have working in the office. Our branch is made up of 30 employees and we'd like some extra space for meetings and presentations. Most average office spaces are around 8,000 square feet but it sounds like you would need more space than that. I think that 10,000 square feet would be more suitable for your needs. Now, let's see, we have 10 properties that match those criteria, so let's try and narrow it down. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you have any other requirements? Well, we'll need access to the office 12 hours a day, but security should be 24 hour. We don't hold any money on the premises, but it's crucial that we protect our customer information against theft. OK, anything else? Yes, ideally I would prefer the new office to be split over two levels, so that the working office area is kept separate from street level. That will enable us to locate a reception at ground floor level to welcome customers when they arrive. And are there any particular facilities that you need? Our employees work very hard throughout the day, and I want to make sure that they're well nourished. It would therefore be ideal if I could provide them with a kitchen to cook hot meals at lunchtime. Would you want the kitchen to be located at first floor level with the office? No, I don't want the office to be filled with the smell of food. It would be better if the new office had a basement where we could locate the kitchen and staff room area to keep it at arm's length from the workspace. OK, I have now narrowed the search to two available properties. Do you have any other requirements that could narrow our search down to one result? All of our office staff will be working at desktop computers so I'll need the office to be equipped with at least 40 power sockets, if possible. Anything else? 
Studies have shown that exercise is very important for maintaining happiness and healthy brain function. In an office environment, it's very difficult to get sufficient daily exercise, so it would be great if they had access to a nearby exercise area. One of the available offices is located next door to a gym. Would this be suitable? Yes, absolutely. A gym is exactly what I was thinking of. Brilliant. Do you need the office to be furnished? I don't think so. I already have some furniture, so I would prefer to bring this myself. That's no problem at all. Ah, uh, and before I forget, we will definitely require Wi-Fi access, as much of our work and customer recruitment is carried out online. No problem. It sounds like the property will suit your needs perfectly. I've taken the liberty of booking you a viewing at 3pm on Thursday, so you can see it for yourself. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, I think that's all the information I need. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. It's been my pleasure to be of assistance. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide giving a talk about a relaxation center. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello everyone, my name is Sally. Welcome to our globally renowned spa and relaxation centre here at Island View Estates. Before you all wander off and begin exploring the facilities, I'd like to go over a few things. Now, this year is a very special milestone for our beloved centre, as it is our 25th anniversary. I understand that this means you have all paid an increased price for your tickets, but I can promise that all of the events we have scheduled for your enjoyment will make the costs well worth it. I know that all of you have travelled a long distance to make it here to the centre of the New Forest, but it is thanks to its remoteness that our centre is such a beautiful place to relax. I am sure you are all keen to find out what activities we have arranged for you, so I will give you a quick overview. Tomorrow we have arranged for you all to participate in a yoga session for the duration of the morning, followed by a day of relaxation at the pool where we have ample sun umbrellas to protect you from the sun. On Wednesday we have organised a sightseeing hike through the forest where you will be able to test your navigation skills and witness the wild ponies in their natural habitat. It's forecast to be sunny that day, but I recommend that you all bring rainproof clothes just in case. On your last day, we have a special surprise, a pony trek along the beach. We ask that you all wear full-length trousers and that all women have their hair tied up in a ponytail. Helmets are provided at the centre for those who would like to wear one. There are a couple of beautiful attractions here at the centre that you must all be sure to visit before you leave. The Rose Garden, located just at the corner of the property, is home to many indigenous species 
and is beautifully serene and peaceful, the perfect place to collect your thoughts or read a book. Our sunset boat ride has been the favourite attraction for many of our visitors. Simply hop aboard and relax whilst we sail you out into the open sea to witness one of the most beautiful spectacles that nature has to offer. Last, but certainly not least, is the freshwater pond, which serves as a watering hole of sorts. Some of you may even be lucky enough to spot our resident kingfishers, who are members of a very rare and endangered species. Once you have all unpacked and settled into your rooms, we will be taking you out to the neighbouring island for a bonfire and barbecue dinner. The island is very small and the bicycle trails make it very easy to explore all of its beautiful corners. As the island is entirely separate from the mainland, it has never been inhabited by wildlife, so you can all roam freely and safely. We have some bonding exercises for you all to take part in around the bonfire, where you can potentially make new friends and discover a lot about yourself. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you'll have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now let me tell you a little bit about the facilities that the resort has to offer. For those of you keen on indulging in a little bit of retail therapy, just wander along to our tourist centre where we have a wide selection of presents on sale at reasonable prices. If you are feeling more drawn to the natural surroundings and scenery, I recommend that you take a trek up the mountain where you can enjoy the panoramic outlook from the peak. For a bit of cultural indulgence, why not pay a visit to our small on-site theatre where you can enjoy watching a range of movies and check out some works by our resident street artists. Just a 10 minute walk down the road is the local art museum where you can roam around the sculpture courtyard or admire the many artworks on display. Here at the resort we are incredibly lucky to be located right next to a nature reserve where many species of endangered wildlife live in the pond. Just on the bank is a small hut where visitors can observe the fish and birds in their natural habitat. Now, if any of you are interested in history, you have the very interesting opportunity to visit the ancient building at the south side of the grounds. The building is now a museum. However, it originally served as a jail for those charged with crimes of treason against the royal family. Well, that just about rounds it up. Now, if anyone has any questions... The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three.
You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Marco. Come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me, please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating, it's important that you can use it once you get a job. It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers. I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on pages 5 and 6. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you learned from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. 
Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. OK. Then, to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So, if I revise my outline... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about a research project on the tiger shark. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 7 and 8. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on the tiger shark. First of all, some background information. The tiger shark, also known as the leopard shark, is often thought to have got its name from its aggressive nature. But in actual fact, it's called that because it has dark bands similar to those on a tiger's body. It is a huge creature, growing up to lengths of six and a half meters. It can be found just about everywhere throughout the world's temperate and tropical seas, but it is most often found along the coast rather than the open sea. In terms of feeding, tiger sharks tend to be most active at night and are solitary hunters. Their preferred prey includes other sharks, turtles, seabirds, and dolphins, to name but a few. However, it's not uncommon to find garbage in its stomach. This is because it tends to feed in areas such as harbors and river inlets, where there is a lot of human activity. Now to the project itself. We are particularly interested in some studies that have been done in the Rain Island area. Observations here have shown that there is a large population of tiger sharks present in the summer during the turtle nesting season. However, during the winter months, the sharks disappear. So we decided to do some of our own research there. The first step was to tag a number of sharks so that we could follow their movements. To do this, we first needed to catch the sharks. Early in the morning, we baited lines with large bits of fish and set them in place. These lines were then checked every three or four hours. If no sharks were caught, the baits were replaced. 
Once a shark had been caught on one of the baited hooks, it was pulled in close to the boat and secured so that we could carry out a number of brief activities to aid our research. This usually took no more than about ten minutes and was carried out as carefully as possible to minimize any stress to the shark. Each of the tiger sharks that we caught was measured and fitted with an identification tag and also a small amount of tissue was taken for genetic studies. For some larger sharks over three meters long, we also inserted into the belly a special acoustic tag capable of sending satellite signals, while on other large sharks we attached a camera to the dorsal fin to enable us to study the behavior and habitat use of the sharks. After this, the shark was released and we were able to follow its movements. So what was the purpose of all this tagging? Well, while we were already familiar with some aspects of the tiger shark's behavior and food sources, what we hoped to do in this project was to see exactly what factors affected the migration patterns of tiger sharks and whether it was, in fact, food, weather, and reproductive needs. These are some of our findings. On February 21st, a large female shark, whom we named Natalie, was attracted to our research boat at the northern tip of Rain Island and fitted with one of the satellite tags I've just mentioned. No transmissions were received from Natalie between April 2nd and April 29th, indicating that she didn't surface to feed during this period. The area in which she was last reported is very shallow, suggesting that she may have changed her feeding preferences during this period to focus on prey found on the sea floor. We also made a number of other discoveries, thanks to the various transmitters we used. It seems that tiger sharks move back and forth between the ocean floor and the surface quite often. This may help the sharks conserve energy while they swim, but it probably also helps them hunt, since this movement back and forth maximizes its chances of not being detected by its prey until the last minute. So far, our findings have not been conclusive. However, we have gained some very interesting insights into the behavior of tiger sharks and are now hoping to develop our research further. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.